give a short introduction of what Brains at Bay is and what this event is about. So yeah, hi everyone. Um, we're still waiting for you to pile in. So I think we're gonna give it around five minutes left, but just welcome to another Brains at Bay. Today, we're gonna be talking about sensory motor learning and how that can lead to more flexible and robust machine learning systems. So for our newer members, we're an online brain inspired machine learning meetup. And this is hosted by Nementa. Our goal here is to foster the study and development of machine learning algorithms heavily inspired by newer science research. So if you're interested in watching one of our previous meetups or you have to leave early today, we record all our sessions and this will be posted on Nementa's YouTube channel. And I'll also post today's meetup um, recording to the meetup page afterwards. For any feedback and suggestions for the next topic and speakers, please feel free to just email me, um, shoot me an email in, this, uh, in the email on the slide below. And also, or you can also send me an email through the meetup page. Um, yeah, and I think Subutai just joined, who's also one of the panelists. Hi, Subutai. Hi, hey guys. So we're very thrilled to have three speakers with us today. There's Richard Sutton from DeepMind and University of Alberta, Clement moulin frie from Flowers Laboratory, and Vivian Clay from Dementa. And if you have any questions for the speakers, please feel free to ask them with the Q&A feature on Zoom. It's right below. You'll see a button and there's an option to ask a question, and you can also vote on existing ones. We'll also try to address a few more questions um, towards the end of each talk, but most of them will be discussed during the discussion panel at the end. And I'll post this blurb again once more people join and I'll just post it on the Zoom chat. So keep an eye out for that. So yeah, let's give it a few more minutes. And with that being said, we'll have Jeff introduce our first speaker at around 10.05. So let's give it three minutes. Okay, what time is it now actually? It's 10.02, so <laughs> I guess we, people are still piling in slowly, so. Yeah, uh, well, yeah. Give it one more minute, but uh, I think I'll, I'll just say a few words while we're waiting. It's it's uh, uh, the Brains at Bay series has been quite successful for us. We uh, we have a lot of people either participate live or uh, online later to view the recordings, and um, and it's been a great forum for uh, getting discussions related to uh, machine intelligence and AI related to brains, which of course is a large part of what Nementa is about. So um, it's always fun to pick a new topic. And, um, and then try to pick who we ideally would like to speak at that uh, Brains at Bay. And we had real success this, this year getting the speakers we wanted. So um, I guess maybe I'll, with that said, maybe I just get started and if people still come late, they can come late. Um, uh, Charmaine has uh, been introducing and running the session. I just thought I would uh, introduce our first speaker, Rich Sutton. Um, Rich, as I say, is one of those people who's quite famous in the field of AI and machine learning. And um, from some people won't need an introduction, but as uh, Charmaine said, he has two positions on it, the University of Alberta and also one at DeepMind Alberta, which I think they created just for you, Rich. I'm not sure that's such a sweet gig. Um, and uh, uh, Rich, of course, is famous for his uh, seminal work in, uh, in uh, reinforcement learning and, uh, and has really come up with some of the, the big ideas there that have become a, a prominent feature of many AI systems. Um, but he's also had a long interest in uh, in uh, uh, sensory motor learning. He's written about that in his blogs and elsewhere. And, um, and so uh, when I, I met him recently in a, uh, in a early this year on a very interesting intellectual forum of sorts uh, discussing my recent book. And um, I enjoyed our conversations. And so uh, I, we thought of him as a perfect speaker for this, uh, for this series about sensory motor learning. And he agreed to speak, which was great. Uh, he also said he'd been thinking about this topic you know, a lot, and he had a, a talk he wanted to give us, which is the title of this talk, as uh, the increasing role of sensory motor learning experience in AI. So, um, Rich, I'm thrilled that you accepted our invitation and that uh, we get to hear uh, your latest thoughts on this topic, which I'm sure are going to be amazing. So, <laughs> I'll turn it over to you. All right, Rich, do you want to share your screen? Let's see about that. Yes, I do. Thank you very much, Jeff. It's a great pleasure to be talking to you all. Um, and uh, let's see if I can share my screen and get started. Perfect, we see it. Okay. I'm just gonna get rid of these Zoom things a little bit. 
I can get rid of. There's some trick. I always have to remember how to, how to get rid of the things. They don't obscure my sides, my slides. Um, right now I'm seeing all your, your faces on top of my, I guess as long as you don't see them, I can probably imagine what I have written there. Okay, um, cool. So um, let me just say though, before we start, is the general idea of the interaction between AI and, and, and between engineering and science and natural science. It's a really fruitful interaction. I'm one of the many people who tends to think that, um, that these two have the same goal. They're heading for the same place. In principle, they could be different. You know, making a machine that was smart and understanding uh, the natural machines that are smart, they might be, have different solutions. But uh, at least up till now, it's much, much most fruitful to pursue them as if they were the same topic. We're trying to understand mind. Now, this is true because the, the things uh, diverge and they're treated in different ways. Um, but this talk today is about how um, really uh, they keep being drawn back into the same, the same questions, the same line of thinking. And the line of thinking is to think about sensory motor experience. Um, and so I'm going to talk about over the history, the 70 year, year history of AI, how uh, we keep coming back to sensory motor experience and, and how it's somewhat begrudging and reluctant. Now, we don't tend to normally think that way in, in AI and uh, we are brought back to it. Okay, so, so I keep talking about experience. Let me tell you just exactly what I mean by that. I mean, just the ordinary uh, interaction, the data, the ordinary interaction. So we have a picture of the agent interacting with the environment, with the world, and it sends actions and it gets back sensations. And those sensations and actions are what we mean by experience, sensory motor experience. And so this, this, these things are obviously involved in reinforcement learning and predictive learning, but they're not involved really in, in supervised learning, which dominates sort of modern machine learning, because that, those systems don't learn from ordinary experience, they learn from special training experience that, that doesn't occur when the system is put in operation and during its normal life, it no longer receives that training information. Okay, so the key thing about experience, experience is the, is the agent's only uh, interaction with the world, it's only source of information about the world, and it has meaning only with respect to other uh, data. Except for one, one case, one instance, is that the reward signal, uh, the reward signal, oh, I think one over, yeah, except for reward, which has a special, uh, it's a special scalar sensation, which has the meaning of being good. Okay, so the, the, the scientific question I want you all to focus on today, we're going to focus on today, is will intelligence ultimately be explained and understood in experiential terms or objective terms? In experiential terms, like sensations and actions and rewards, time steps and things inside the agent, or will it be understood in objective terms, things outside the agent, like objects and people and space and motion and all these things outside? Um, this is a key question. And uh, so you might ask yourself what you think. Will we understand the mind as something that talks about data streams going in and out, or will we understand the mind as something that, that understands the, the external physical world? Okay, and then the, my theme is, is, is that the AI has taken steps towards uh, increasing role of experience. Um, and I identify four of them. First step is just the idea of an agent and the idea of having experience. Um, second is the idea of is reward, where your goals of your agent are in terms of experience. And third is experiential state, what your state is in terms of experience. And then finally, your knowledge is in terms of experience. And you're going you're gonna to see this slide many times. Don't worry about it too much, memorizing these, these four steps. I'm going to kind of, kind of use, use this as my outline and come back to it over and over again. Um, the, the message in, in the four steps is that for each of them, AI has, has reluctantly uh, allowed experience to enter into their thought patterns. It's, it's something they, they do, they don't do first. First, they, they, they think in terms of the external world. And then later, 
when they're forced to or to get the advantages of being uh, more learnable and more grounded and more scalable that they bring in experience. So let's get started. Step number one, which is agenthood, which really is just having experience. Now you have to have an, be an agent, you have to have sensations and actions. And simply true that in the early days of AI, they're, they're, they didn't have agents, and they didn't have experience. So uh, if you look at the first, the first 30 years or so, AI systems were mostly problem solvers and question answers. They had no sensations and no actions. Now, there was always some robotics, but that was an exception. Uh, a typical problem was they were given a start state and a goal state, and, and there were operators, um, state transformation steps, but they were not expressed in terms of actions. And there were, certainly there was no uh, perception or sensation. The solution was a sequence of operators. And in fact, um, you, you, you never actually executed your solution because your operators were deterministic. And so you knew what would be the outcome of each one. And so once you con constructed the sequence of operators, you knew you had a solution. You didn't actually have to do it. So there was no doing and there was no perceiving in, in classic uh, AI. Now, in the last 30 years, AI has switched and focused on building agents. Um, and this happened about 1990, you know, it happened roughly uh, and slowly and in a, you know, over many years. Um, from this, this is a quote, these are some quotes from the 1995 edition. This is the first edition of what is now the standard AI textbook, Russell and Norvig. And they based their book on the idea of agents. Um, and at the time, that was. Uh, controversial, not controversial to talk about agents, but controversial to base the field of AI on an agent perspective. And so these are some quotes. They say, the underlying theme of the book is the concept of an intelligent agent. And in this view, the problem of AI is to describe and build agents that receive percepts from the environment and perform actions, okay? This is sensation. You have to have, you have to be an agent in order to have sensations in action. And it became standard in the second half of the field of AI. And now it is pretty, it is standard. Okay, so that's really what I wanna say, step one, that we should be aware that this has really happened. Nowadays, I mean, nowadays we just take it for granted that there is agenthood in AI, but it wasn't really always the, uh, the dominant view. Okay, so let's go on now to reward. Because I think, I, the way I think about reward is it really is the second step in embracing experience within AI. So reward means your goal is in terms of experience. And AI is uneasy with this idea of reward, uh, but it's warming to it. Uh, if you look at the latest edition of the AI textbook, uh, it, will, it will define goals as world states. World states reach also has chapters on reinforcement learning and those use reward. Um, now with the ri rise of machine learning and AI, the reward formulation is, is just becoming standard. Um, for example, in Markov decision processes are, are, are thought of as, a standard, as one standard way of doing planning. And even critics like Jan LeCun would admit that reward is the cherry on the top of the cake of intelligence. It's there, maybe it's not super important, but everyone is going to use it as the formulation of the goal uh, if they're gonna think about an actual intelligent agent. Um, today, rewards have been proposed as a sufficient, uh, complete way of thinking about goals. Um, so this is a quote from uh, a recent paper. Um, it's about the reward is enough hypothesis suggesting that intelligence and all its associated abilities can be understood as subserving the maximization of reward. Just sort of presenting explicitly this idea of the reward hypothesis. Okay, maybe do I wanna say more about that. Uh, yeah, I do wanna say something about that because for many, many, many people, uh, reward doesn't seem like it's enough, okay? The, the proposal is that it's enough, but doesn't seem enough, enough maybe for animals, or for engineering, but it's not enough as an understanding of what people are, what people do. A single number from outside the mind just seems too small and too reductive and too demeaning that people's goals seem grander uh, 
raise a family, save the planet, contribute to human understanding, or make the world a better place. Surely our goals are more uh, grander than just maximizing our pleasure and comfort. So all these things are, are, are I can empathize with all these things. I think we can all empathize. And, and you know, that's what I'm trying to do in this talk. I, I want you to empathize with both sides. You know, there, there is, there is a, a, a way that we want, we want, we don't want to think about our goals as being a number coming into our brain. We want to think about our goals as doing something out in the world. These are the two different perspectives thinking about what's going on in the world and achieving it and thinking about um, the number coming into your, your mind. And these two ways of thinking, um, we, have, we always start with one and then we're driven back towards an experiential thing, thinking about these, these numbers going into our head, these signals going into our, into our head. And you know, there, there are reasons we like that, reasons we don't like that. I want you to empathize with both of them and just sort of understand this tension that's going on and how historically uh, in AI specifically, um, we reach first for the ex external terms and then we are gradually uh, driven to experience. I want us to understand that that's happened and then understand why it's happened and, and to what extent it's gonna to continue to happen. Okay, so that's what I want to say about reward. It's a good, these are, these are good past examples of this begrudging acceptance and embracing of experience. And I, the next two steps are going to be more about the future, although they are in progress. Uh, but I want to take a little interlude and just talk a little bit more concretely about experience so you know what I'm trying to say. So let's just look at experience. And here's some, some imaginary experience where we have time steps clicking along here. And, and like maybe right now we're at the most recent time step seven and we see, we see some sensations, some numbers, some symbols, and we generate some output bits. Okay, and so these output bits are, are binary zeros and ones and the sensory bits are, are not bits, right? These seem to be bits, but then these other signals seem to have four, zero to three, four values. And this other signal uh, looks like it's continuous. It could be positive, it could be negative, okay? So that would be um, what experience might look to coming into your, into your mind at some fast time scale, like a 10th of a second. Okay, now, now that you understand what's going on, I, I, it looks kind of, it's kind of busy and kind of difficult to have intuitions about. So I'm going to um, con convert it to colors and, and more, make it more visual. Uh, I'm gonna make the zeros and ones will be white and gray, and these four valued signals will be four different colors. Uh, these also are also bits, but they're action bits, so I'll make them circled grays and whites. And, and uh, the positive things are gonna be green bars where the length of the bar indicates how big the number is and the negative ones will be, will be pink. And now they understand exactly what this means. I can take away the, the numbers and make it less cluttered. So here I have a look at the data that, that, that might be coming into a mind. And uh, now we can see, take on the activity of the mind, which is to observe its data and try to look for patterns and try to predict it and understand it. And generally trying to understand it, maybe control it. And so if you look at this data, you might see some patterns. In. There are patterns in this data. This is data that, that's uh, you know, made up, it's generated by a program, but it's not, it's, not, it's not random, not entirely random. And so I'm just using it to help you think about, you know, what, what is the job of the mind? Look for patterns in data. So if you looked at this for a while, you might see some patterns. Uh, here's, a, here's something you might notice. That if the action, the, third, the last action is white, then the first bit of the data is white. And if, the, if, it's, if it's gray, then it's gray. And this actually holds up throughout the data. So, so that looks like 
this action is, is having a direct influence on the next sensation. So that's an example of a pattern in the data. There, there are others. Um, this, this is one. If there's a red, I'll call it a pixel. It's not really a pixel, but it's a, it's a component of the data stream. If it's red on one time step, then the, the sixth, sixth component is on the next time step is green. And that happens once, it happens twice. We don't really know if it's a pattern. It could just be chance. We, we really need more data to establish that. So, so let's get some more data. Let's just carry this out further and for a couple of columns. And um, then we can see first, here's the, that pattern you saw before. And yes, indeed, that is carried out throughout the data uh, many, many times. So that seems to be an effect. And um, if you look for additional things, you, you could, if you studied it for a long time, you would find that, that after this little pattern, two steps later, the, you always get a blue signal. So this carries throughout the data as well. So this is, a, this is the idea of a major activity of the mind is looking for these patterns, trying to predict successfully the future uh, sensations and particularly trying to predict reward. Um, and let's see, there's one more uh, pattern in this data. I, don't, I wonder if you could see it. You might be able to see it. Um, if you look at the, the last three sensory signals, not the reward, but the last three regular ones, these guys, and uh, they have some patterns. I'll give you a moment just to look at them. It's, a, it's not the same kind of pattern. Does anyone see anything about the last three? Well, um, you may notice- There seems to be like some here. sort of a temporal correlation. Um, you know, these these vertical stripes of color. <laughs> Very good, Subutai. That's that's exactly what it is. Like there's the vertical striation, like all these yellows, uh, and then later like all these greens, all these reds. So it, it, it's like, you know, once it starts doing a color, it likes to stay with that color much more so than the other colors. And that's, that's, that's the way it's been set up. And so now we can see ways in which the, the sensations can be uh, qualitatively different. Um, this is what, these tend to be sticky, right? These last three tend to be sticky. Um, these first four only have two values. Um, and the, the, then there are these temporal small relationships between the, the data. So the, there's all kinds of ways, even though it's just, you know, bits or, or, or elementary signals, um, they can be qualitatively different from each other. Um, Short-term and long-term relationships, lots of things that could be predicted. Um, Predictions may not be just of their sensory signals. So like all, all of these, these little things are all about what, what a particular sensory signal will be at a particular future time. Uh, but you might wanna predict um, th uh, combinations of future things. Now before that, that seems too complicated. I'm gonna remind those of you who, who already know about it that you know, the main thing we do in reinforcement learning is we predict the discounted sum of the future reward. We predict future reward. Uh, so I think I have an example of that here. Um, yeah, so this is the return is what we're predicting. We're, we're trying to predict time steps where there's a lot of reward coming up. So like here, this, this uh, let's take this green bar. This green bar is, is big, means there's a lot of reward after it. So there's all these three, these three big bars of reward uh, and they're weighted. Uh, I guess I could, so here we see, yeah, this is big because the, the, the weighting, there's a lot of green bars coming up imminently after this one, okay, in the reward. And so uh, this, this kind of slides along and we get um, each prediction. Here we're predicting negative because there's mostly negative things coming up uh, under this weighting. Okay, and so, so here, 
when we predict the return, the return is, is not an actual number that you see. It's not in your sensation. This, this column is, is unlike the others. It's not a sensory signal. It's, a, it's the correct prediction of the future. The correct prediction of the future at this time is to predict a lot of, of red coming up, a lot of negative reward coming up. Okay, and so, you know, also you might predict, you might predict anything about the future, but the sum of the, uh, in the next 100 uh, uh, time steps, I'll have, you know, more ones than I will have zeros, or I might predict, you know, twice as many ones as if there are zeros. And that, that's not a signal that will be, will be measured later. It's a, it's a function of the future. So these are the most important things. They're, 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 they're functions of the future and prediction of, of value is, is one example of that. And this has been generalized to general value functions, which predict any signal, not just reward. They have a flexible envelope, not just exponentially fallen. And they be contingent on the policy. So, like, you know, I will see this object in my hand if I do the actions to pick it up and, and wave it in front of myself. So, uh, now, now that we've said the predictions can be anything, we don't want to have arbitrary predictions because ma many predictions are hard to compute efficiently. We want things that can that we can predict efficiently. So, this is, becomes the bread and butter, as I see it, of an experiential approach to AI. Okay, now that was a bit of, that ends my interlude. So now maybe we know more concretely what experience means and what it's like to deal with it. Let's, let's go on to deal with state. Okay, so as, as in all the other cases, conventionally in AI, we start out talking about objective state, external world state. Uh, this block is on the other block. John loves Mary. These are all statements about absolutely external things. And um, even in more modern things like probabilistic graphical models, the state is still probability distribution over the world states. And here's a probabilistic graphical model. You know, the states are like, it's cloudy outside, it's raining, the grass is wet. These are uh, states of the, of the world, the sprinkler is on. And uh, another canonical case is POMDPs, partially observable mark decision processes, in which case the state is a probability distribution over underlying world states. It's explicitly in terms of underlying world states. And so I'm going to call all these things objective state representations. They're all separated from the individual. They're about the world. And that's the way AI has started. So the alternative called experiential state, here we define the state of the world entirely in terms of experience. So the, the, the formal statement is that an experiential state is a summary of past experience that is useful for predicting and controlling future experience. Summary of past experience is good for predicting future. And so there's no mention of external entities out there in the world. There's just experience, experience, you summarizing experience to predict experience. And this is uh, the way we talk experientially about state. And this is this is done in some of the some of the fields, like the simplest cases where you just build it in. In Atari, we re remember the last four frames of video, and we and that becomes the state. Uh, or maybe you also need to know the recent actions. When they do compression, uh, you have to summarize something about what you've seen to help you predict and compress the data as you move along. And LSTMs, if you know what that that, that means. Um, or is the way in deep learning where they, they, they uh, summarize the past so that something doesn't have to be in the current observation. And all these methods uh, have and they learn and discover experiential state. Um, so experiential state, if you think about it, it, it should be done recursively. Like if you just take it naively, like summarizing, the, 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 these are supposed to mirror what we saw earlier. This is sensation, action, sensation, action, sensation, action. This is all the past. and you might want to summarize all the past in the current state before you pick your action. Okay. But this is, this would be a poor way to do it because think what it means as you, as you, you really need the state at all these earlier times and you, and it's just awkward to, to, to bring in all the past at each point. This is a better approach because the last state should summarize everything before. So like this state really should only need to know the previous state. 
because the previous state should summarize everything before that, and it leaves the state before that, and so on. So you, you have this sort of lattice structure, and that's a useful where you're you're doing it recursively, and that leads to a, a picture which will I think eh, make sense that you have some sort of perceptual process that's producing the state, and it has to use the most recent state as well as the last action and the last sensation, and then this experiential state is what you that would use to as input to your policy to pick an action, and maybe you'd use it as input to your predictions. And um, right here, I think I wanna just stick with this for a moment and, and think about what the whole picture would look like. This is just perception. Like what we're talking about so far is like the, the axis of, of, of the agent. You know, I, I, he has to perceive things and figure out where he is. And then he has to use that to pick, a, pick, his, pick his action. That's the most important thing an agent does senses and acts. Um, but we also have predictions and we also might want to have a model of the world. And so this is the full picture. The full basic picture is that we have the central axis and then we also have predictions that we uh, use by learning processes to adjust the policy. And then we also have this model of the world. Really it's a transition model because so much of the model is also here. But the transition part is after the state and it, it's state to state transitions. And that transition model is also used through processes to adjust the policy and those processes we call planning <clears throat> or reasoning. Uh, and those, that's how we bring together all four of the steps, agenthood, reward, uh, state and knowledge. Uh, I really wanna, yeah, so let's go on then to knowledge. The last one, the biggest one, uh, knowledge, where we say that to know is to predict experience or, func or functions of experience. Okay, and let's just start out with the grand, the grandness of the challenge, because uh, normally we think about knowledge, we don't think seem to talk about experience. We'd say, you know, Joe Biden is president, uh, the Eiffel Tower is in Paris, birds have wings, Oregon is north of California, the car is ten meters ahead, fire engines are red. These things. Are, seem to be about the external world. This is our normal way of talking about the world. But there's other knowledge which is um, more experiential. It feels more about experience. You know, it's a long walk to the city center. I can, I can lift 200 pounds. It's cold outside today. My spouse is blonde. My foot is sore. The seventh pixel will be blue in three steps, right? That's pretty experiential. Uh, but overall, there's a gap. There's a gap. A huge gulf, really, uh, between uh, like Joe Biden as president and the seventh pixel. Um, it's a huge gap, and the question was whether it's an uncoverable gap, if it's irreconcilable, or whether with with hard work and dedication we uh, we'll, we will be able to do that. And so the first step is just to note that there is a huge gap between common sense notion of knowledge and experiential statements. And now if we look at the, the history of AI, um, the classical uh, AI systems, which are called good old fashioned AI systems. That's what GoFi means, good old fashioned AI. It's been uh, embraced by the good old fashioned AI types as, 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 uh, as not really a bad thing. They, they accept that. Uh, but those original systems, you know, they didn't have uh, experience. They couldn't really talk about prediction. And um, much modern AI still treats knowledge as like a database. So like this is what a database would look like. You know, the president of the U.S. is equal to Joe Biden. The capital of France is Paris. Um, not predictive at all. Um, and then we go back to those probabilistic graphical models, those are not predictive either because it's all about simultaneous events. You know, they'd have things like, well, if it's uh, cloudy, then there's a higher probability that it's gonna rain, uh, but it's, it's not, it, it's viewed as statements about simultaneous events. There is no prediction in, in a temporal sense. Okay, but, but it, it's nowadays, it's coming to the fore uh, to think of the world in a, as a predictive model or, or think of it as knowledge as a predictive model. And I would say 
the cutting edge of the predictive knowledge approach is the ideas of general value functions and option models. So uh, let's think a little bit more about world knowledge. Uh, I don't, I'm not, I'm, 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 I would exclude mathematical knowledge as world knowledge because math is true in any world. It's, it's not even about the world. It's, 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 it's knowledge of a kind, but it's not world knowledge. World knowledge proper can be divided into two types, knowledge about the state, which we've already talked about, step three. Um, and now we're talking about uh, knowledge about state transitions, that kind of predictive knowledge of the world. So, and then a state to state predictive model, it doesn't have to be low level. It doesn't have to be like differential equations. It doesn't have to be like a Markov decision process. The model can be abstract in state if it's using experiential state. Well, yeah, actually, I guess it, generally it can be abstract in state. And it can, uh, what I want to highlight now is it can be abstract in time. So predictions can be conditioned on entire ways of behaving, you know, like if I walk to the city center, right, that will take many, many tenths of a second time steps. And so there's a, there's a well developed way of dealing with this. Um, and so if we've conditioned the prediction on the entire ways of behaving, the, these ways of behaving are called options. And an option is just a policy, the way of behaving, plus a way for it to terminate. And then you can make a transition model for the option. It's well understood and we know how to learn them. And then the question is, uh, uh, is it sufficient? Is this option models and uh, sufficient to, to express all the kinds of knowledge we want to have about the world? Can we bridge this abstraction gap between experience and knowledge? That's the challenge. And that's guys are working on that. So that's the fourth step and last step. And I'll remind you that the, 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 the pattern is that for each step, AI has started out by doing non-experiential things and has gradually moved towards an experiential point of view in order to be grounded, connected to, to data um, and to be learnable and to scale with computer, computer power. So as you get more computer power, you want, you want your systems to become more powerful. And that's harder to do if you're reliant on human understanding than if you can process the data. Okay, so in summary, I've discussed these four steps. I'm not gonna talk through them again, but for each step I've shown A has worked in objective non-experts of terms, but there is this less familiar approach. Um, yeah, and I guess I took out the slides in, in the sake of time to reminding us why, why we think in experiential terms. Let me just point out that why we like to think in both, terms. First, why we like objective terms. Objective terms, I think, are the right terms for almost everything that humans do. Like humans talk to each other, humans, humans work together. They want they work, they, they need to talk about the external world. So for almost everything we actually do, uh, we both understand the words, and so we should talk about the external world. Um, but the exception maybe is understanding the mind. The exception is building robots. The robots don't have that understanding a priori, we have to, we have to uh, develop it and, and, and relate it to their sensations and their actions. Um, and so for that, we need, we need to talk about experience. Now these trends, which we see historically, you know, there's no reason why just because something's happened before, it'll happen more and it'll happen again. But I think it could, they could go much further. Um, there are research opportunities. And ultimately, perhaps the story of intelligence may be told in sensory motor terms. Now, I, I'm gonna show one more. Sometimes I try to make uh, uh, my message really simple, maybe, maybe too simple, but if I try to really express th this in, in a single slogan, it would look something like this. Uh, data drives AI and experience is the ultimate data. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. That was great. Thank you. Oh, uh, that was great, Rich.
That was great. So let's, we have a lot of questions, but let's address them in the discussion panel since I'm wary of time. So yeah, let's have Clement present next and we'll have Vivian introduce him while he pulls up his slide. But thank you so much, Rich. Yeah, first of all, thanks a lot. No, I don't. Talk. Um, is there something else? No. Have I, 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 I'm, have I unshared? No, I think so. <laughs> not yet. No, not yet. I'm, I'm having difficulty seeing how to do it. Um, I think on the top of the screen, you can press stop share maybe. Yeah, but I, I hid that part. <laughs> I don't know how to bring it back. <laughs> um, maybe it's here. Yeah, you would think after two years of COVID. Uh, I got you. I figured it out. Good. But Thank you. It. I took it off. Still Thank struggle you. every time. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, I'm happy to introduce uh, Clement muller I hope I'm pronouncing this right. Uh, he's uh, working at the Flowers Lab at INRIA in Bordeaux. He received his PhD in 2009 at the University of Grenoble working on the role of action perception relationships in communication. And after that, he spent some time working on the USC Brain Project in Los Angeles, and also working as a postdoc at CNRS in Paris, as well as the Pompeo Fabra University in Barcelona. He also spent two years at a startup called Cogit AI, working on continually learning interactive AI. And uh, recently he's published some very interesting work on integrating developmental and ecological perspectives on intelligence and humans into artificial intelligence research. So thank you, Clement, for accepting our invitation and I'm very much looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. And, and do, do you see my slides or my notes? I have a doubt. Yes. Yes, we do. Okay, excellent. All right. Okay, well, first of all, thank you very much to the organizers of, the, of this meetup. It's great to be, to be here today. And so I'm, I might be a bit less well known than Red Shutton. So, yeah, I, I will maybe introduce uh, myself a bit more at the beginning. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm from the Flowers Group at INRIA in, uh, in France. And so the, the Flowers Group um, basically studies models of open-ended development and learning. And these models, we use them as tools to help us understand better how children learn, and also to build machines that learn uh, like children, which is what we have recently called uh, developmental artificial uh, intelligence. And so I, I have we joined the followers team uh, a couple of years ago, and, uh, and recently I have been starting a new research direction in, uh, in this group, which attempts at integrating our original uh, developmental perspective with an evolutionary and ecological uh, perspective on open-ended skill acquisition in humans and machines. And so in my talk today, I will try to highlight the base principles uh, behind this integrative effort. And also I will illustrate it with um, a couple of computational experiments. So while well, in a sense, if which certain talk was about uh, the role of sensory motor experience in AI, my talk can be seen a bit more as uh, about the, the mechanisms that generate uh, this experience in a dynamic way. So uh, as we can observe it, Basically, every day, and the human species has this surprising tendency to continually invent new problems and to acquire new skills to solve them. So then the question is, what are the mechanisms that support what we often call uh, open-ended skill acquisition? And so to try to address this question, I will start with an evolutionary perspective on learning. So how learning evolved, evolved uh, that is, in which conditions does it provide an evolutionary advantage? And so Stephens, for example, in the, in the 90s, uh, proposed that learning can only be beneficial for certain trade-offs between predictability and variability in an agent's uh, experience. And he distinguishes two types of experience predictability, 
within generation and between generation uh, predictability. And so the, the first column in this table here on the left basically says that when within generation predictability is low and regardless of between generation predictability, learning is useless simply because, well, there is nothing to learn. It's too unpredictable. And on the opposite, if between generation uh, predictability is high, then evolution has no reason to promote learning. Typically, innate behaviors genetically passed from generation to generation can do the job. So the interesting case when it comes to learning uh, seems to be when between generation predictability is low and within generation predictability is high. And so this simple framework raises a first interesting question, which is what are the, what are the processes generating experience and predictability within and between generations? And how do these uh, processes interact? Then from a developmental uh, perspective, it has been proposed that biological, motor, and cognitive development uh, can be considered as a complex dynamical system. And a typical example uh, comes from the Wellington epigenetic uh, landscape metaphor, which is illustrated here in the figure. So on this figure, basically, we can consider the shape of the landscape as a set of environmental and organismal influences on the agent development. And the motion of this metaphoric ball here on the landscape reflects the developing phenotype that changes through time as the ball is rolling. But importantly, even tiny differences in the landscape or on the ball properties can lead to a quite different developmental trajectories. And each possible trajectory corresponds to an attractor, so that taking one path or another depends on many internal and external processes, for example, morphological, cognitive, or environmental processes. And so this second framework raises a second question, which is what are the behavioral strategies that can efficiently deal with the experience unpredictability, which is induced by church landscape. Okay, so this leaves us with two main questions, which form the outline of the, of the talk. And so I will start with an evolutionary slash ecological perspective, where I will present a preliminary proposition of a framework which aims at understanding what are the processes generating experience unpredictability and how these processes interact at multiple spatiotemporal scales. And then I will switch to a more developmental perspective where I will present the concept of intrinsic motivation as a strategy that efficiently deal with experience and predictability. And also uh, two computational experiments on developmental machine learning. So let's start with um, an evo eco perspective about the processes uh, that generate experience predictability, both between and within generations. So for this, we have recently proposed a conceptual framework with my colleague Elin Niciotti, which aims at fostering connections between research in AI and in human behavioral ecology. So this field of human behavioral ecology, which I will abbreviate as HBE, seeks to understand how the behaviors characterizing the human species can be conceived as adaptive responses to major changes in the structure of our ecological niche. And we believe that these two fields can strongly inform each other, and in particular for understanding open-ended skill acquisition in humans and for implementing it in machines. So this framework is typically a preliminary step in this direction. So under this framework, environmental complexity is originally driven by climate variability, which implies instability in the ecological conditions, in particular through changes in resource availability and exposition to predators. And uh, this is based on recent hypotheses in paleoclimatology and human behavioral ecology, which actually point at a very particular climate dynamics in the Rift Valley at East Africa approximately uh, 7 million years ago which complex patterns in climate variability that could have had a strong influence on early uh, human evolution. And in particular, regarding our ability to quickly generalize and to extend our behavioral repertoire to changing environments. And so 
Whereas there is an analogous tendency in AI towards increased complexity in simulation environments, uh, these environments are, however, never influenced by um, this existing hypothesis in, uh, in human behavioral ecology. And so this is a gap we are currently trying to bridge uh, in, uh, in our research group. Then this environmental complexity is supposed to have strong feedforward influence on two major phenomena. Firstly, it drives adaptability both at the evolutionary and developmental time scale, which here again reflects a current trend in AI to couple reinforcement learning methods with evolutionary algorithms. And second, varying the levels of resource availability, resource availability and exposition to predators has a strong influence on multi-agent dynamics through the modulation of cooperation and competition pressures, which in AI is currently mostly studied through the multi-agent response learning framework and its link to game theory. So the influence of environmental complexity and adaptability and multi-agent dynamics can then have a feed forward and feedback effects on other components of, um, of the entire system. So first, it feeds back to environmental complexity through the modification of resource availability and predation pressures. And in human uh, behavioral ecology, this positive feedback loop is often uh, referred as an evolutionary arms race, while in AI, it has sometimes been called um, autocurricula. This is when an agent adaptability modifies the fitness landscape of the environment. Second, um, adaptability and multi-agent dynamics can bootstrap in a fit-forward manner the emergence of more advanced behaviors related to technology, communication, and culture. And this reflects uh, recent contributions in multi-agent uh, RL that also, also study how agents can form a cultural repertoire, for example, discovering tool use, communication, and social norms as the emergent product of uh, multi-agent learning. And so finally, uh, under this framework, the emergence of a cultural repertoire feeds back into environmental complexity through the processes of cultural niche construction, bootstrapping a positive feedback loop, potentially driving the ever-expanding social complexity of uh, human skill acquisition. And so a few contributions in AI have studied just feedback effects. Also, I believe that most remains to be done in this area, and I will present later in this talk the contributions uh, which we think is an important step in this direction. So the, the framework I have just presented is, is just a preliminary proposition, but I believe it is of interest for three main reasons. First, because it highlights the links between two different domains that usually don't interact together, namely artificial intelligence and human behavioral ecology. Second, because it can help to understand whole processes operating at multiple spatiotemporal scales can generate experience predictability uh, through feed forward and feedback effects. And third, because it provides a tentative uh, roadmap for achieving human-like open-ended skill acquisition in artificial systems. And this roadmap is grounded in theories and hypotheses from human behavioral ecology. Okay, so I will switch now to a, a more developmental perspective, and I will first present the concept of intrinsic motivation as a strategy to efficiently deal with experience and predictability. And then I will present computational experiments showing how intrinsic motivation can spontaneously structure developmental trajectories towards the discovery of communication and the acquisition of an open-ended repertoire of skills. So we, we have seen in the introduction that learning mostly makes sense in environments that are neither too predictable, so that learning has an evolutionary advantage over hardwired behaviors, nor too unpredictable, so that there is actually something to learn. So let, let's imagine you are living in a relatively unpredictable environment. For example, you are an early homo uh, living in East Africa a few, a few million years ago where chaotic climate dynamics modulate resource availability and exposition to predators across generations. Or maybe easier to imagine, you are just a young baby in a room full of toys and other objects. How to efficiently collect informative training data to acquire interesting skills in just complex unknown environments. 
So one answer from developmental psychology comes from the observation that children spend a lot of time spontaneously exploring their environment. So let's observe it by ourselves. So this is a video of a baby which is alone in a room, it's not hungry, not thirsty. There are no other humans interacting uh, here. And so from a rational point of view, one may think that if the evolutionary fitness of this guy is just to grow up and to reproduce, then he should probably keep safe. He should avoid putting the fingers in the plug. He basically should do nothing and just wait his parents to provide him food when he will become uh, hungry. And yet, as we see here, this is not at all what he does. He goes for the fingers in the plug. He explores uh, his body. He tries to grasp. He throws all of the around. And he's not doing uh, this because they are externally imposed tasks or, or rewards, but rather it is driv div driven by different forms of what psychologists call intrinsic motivation and what we may call curiosity in everyday language. So from an evolutionary perspective, such an intrinsic motivation to learn can be explained because it maximizes long-term evolutionary fitness under rapidly changing environmental conditions. And I will precise at the end of, uh, of my talk how this integrates with the Evoeco conceptual framework I have presented uh, just before. So during exploratory play, exploratory play, for example, children invent and pursue their own goals, which makes them uh, very efficient at solving novel problems with past rewards, as well as uh, learn world models and discover an open and did skill repertoire. And a number of teams uh, in the world, including our group, have worked now for a while on modeling these capabilities and studying how they can be transferred in AI. And uh, a general framework we have proposed uh, in the Flowers group to computationally model intrinsic motivation in artificial agents is called intrinsically motivated goal exploration processes. Or IMJEP. So what we call an IMJEP, well, IMJEP basically refers to all the algorithms that loop through the following steps. First, uh, an agent observes the current context of the environment it is in. Let's say, for example, uh, a robot observing, observing objects on a table. Second, the agent samples the goal in the goal space. For example, it might want to stack the objects together or to place them side by side. Third, the agents uh, roll out an action policy conditioned by the sample goal. For example, moving its body to, its body to displace uh, the objects on the table. And uh, fourth, it observes, it, it observes the outcome and updates in certain internal models accordingly. In particular, refining the learned action policies to better achieve uh, the targeted goals. And then these four steps will be it uh, indefinitely. So despite the apparent simplicity, these IMJs have actually proven to be very powerful at efficiently and robustly discovering how to achieve a wide variety uh, of self-generated goals in complex environments. And they have been applied uh, to supervise learning problems, for example, learning forward or inverse models in robotics, also to model uh, child development, for example, vocal control, and uh, more recently to goal condition reinforcement learning agents in AI. And so in the following, I will focus on two computational experiments, which both uh, rely on this framework. So the first experiment is about uh, the self-organization of vocal development. And so here we apply an IMJEP to explore the capabilities of a relatively original sensory motor system, at least in AI, which is the human vocal tract. So for this aim, we use um, an articulatory synthesizer, which is a computer model of the human vocal tract able to produce sound waves from vocal articulatory trajectories. So this model can, for example, simulate uh, movements of the jaw, of the tongue, of the lips, the vibration of the vocal folds, and then compute uh, the resulting vocal sound waves. So learning to control uh, such an articulatory synthesizer 
or more generally a, a vocal tract, is actually a classical ro uh, robotic control problem. How to reach certain uh, auditory targets through uh, the execution of certain motor commands. And these motor commands here are articulatory trajectories. And this can be achieved by learning an inverse model, which maps targeting effects in the auditory uh, trajectory space, which is here a 6D space, two motor commands in, the artic in uh, an articulatory trajectory space, which is here a 18D space. But to learn an adequate inverse uh, model, the agent needs to collect informative uh, sensory motor data. And the problem is that with such a complex sensory motor, uh, sensory motor mapping, randomly generated articulatory trajectories mostly lead to vocal movements where no sound is produced at all. And this is basically useless uh, if one wants to learn an inverse model from this data. So instead, a solution to efficiently explore such uh, systems is the one proposed by the IMJEP uh, framework I previously described. And in this particular experiment, uh, we consider that the agent is sampling uh, auditory goals here, sorry, and that the goal condition policy is implemented by uh, the inverse model, which is iteratively learned and refined through experience. So what happens when running uh, this uh, type of um, intrinsically motivated goal exploration process which is a generic uh, sensory motor exploration process in a simulated model of the human vocal tract. So we, we showed that it can qualitatively reproduce the first stages of early vocal development observed in most infants. And so the agent first explores random articulatory movements and therefore mostly produce articulatory trajectories that are not efficient for vocalization, which is what we call no phonician uh, here on the figure. Then it spontaneously discovers how to produce unarticulated vocalizations in which it manages to roughly coordinate the pressure applied to the vocal folds and the opening of the vocal tract, which results in a vowel-like sound. Uh, and then it will focus on these unarticulated sounds uh, for a while as it is making progress in learning how to achieve them. And so finally, the agent uh, spontaneously discovers articulated vocalizations where it can maintain phonation while modulating the opening of its vocal tract through the control of its articulators, which result in protosyllables analog to canonical babbling in infants. This kind of ba 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 sound you hear in young infants. So what is interesting in this experiment is that this emerged developmental sequence is actually very aligned with what is observed during the first year uh, of vocal development in infants. And it is important to note here that neither the vocal categories nor the developmental uh, sequence were hard coded in this experiment, but instead they emerge from the dynamic interaction between the learning system, the intrinsic motivation system, the body and the environment, which all operate in high dimensional continuous spaces. And so in the second version of this model, we also showed how this type of goal-directed exploration could account for the late influence of ambient language uh, and vocal production, but no, I, I won't have time to, to describe it now. So uh, another interesting aspect uh, in this experiment is that if we run it many times with basically different random seeds, we observe at the same time strong regularities and diversity in the developmental uh, trajectories. For example, some phases or some sequences of phases appear often, but sometimes some phases are reversed and even some vocal agents have weird developmental trajectories. And all of this with the exact same mechanism and the same hyperparameters, just different random seeds. And so this duality between regularity and diversity is also very typical of uh, child development. And in fact, this can be understood as the system is a dynamical system where different developmental trajectories are different attractors in the spirit of the Waddington epigenetic landscape metaphor I have presented in the intro. Okay, so the main lesson from this model is that some forms of human language, like its phonological or its syllabic structure, can actually emerge from a very generic intrinsically motivated exploration mechanism, independently of any functional pressure to communicate. And this has two important implications. The first one is that 
Well, this, this typically suggests that in principle, the infant may develop initial speech capabilities without an innate specific bias for learning speech and vocal interaction. And second, we believe that such emergent developmental structures can guide and constrain evolution by constituting a reservoir of behavioral and cognitive innovations, which can be later on recruited for functions that are not yet anticipated. Okay, so I will now present a, a last uh, experiment, a short one showing how language was invented, can be recruited as a powerful, cogn powerful cognitive tool that enables uh, compositional imagination and bootstraps uh, open-ended innovation. So one particular usage of language we have been recently focusing on in the Flowers group is imagination, and how the compositional structure of language can be leveraged to generate goals uh, that are out of distribution. So what, what does this mean? For, typically, for example, in the previous uh, experiment I have shown, the space in which the agent can sample the goals uh, was fixed. And the agent could only sample goals within uh, that predefined space. But to power a creative exploration, however, agents will need to generate novel, creative, and abstract goals. Goals that are out of distribution of the things already seen. And in this process, children use language as a creative tool. And the architecture I'm going to present is actually going uh, grounded in key ideas from the developmental psychology and linguistic literature. So Piaget first discovered that children used egocentric speech to narrate their, their ongoing activities. Later, Vygotsky showed that they used it to generate goals and plan to solve them. And language is indeed uh, compositional and creative by nature, as Chomsky illustrated with this uh, extravagant construction, colorless green ideas sleep firstly. And so the compositionality of language can be used to generate out of distribution goals, that is to imagine new goals from not one, from known one. So. For example, if I know what a cat and a bus are, then I can easily compose the two to generate a new concept, a cat bus. And I can very easily picture in my mind what it would uh, look like. And so if you're interested to know more about these inspirations, uh, I recommend to check out our recent blog post on this topic. So inspired by this series, we have recently introduced Imagine, which is an intrinsically motivated learning architecture that leverages natural language interactions with the social peer to explore procedurally generated scenes and interact with objects. And so the agent operates in an environment that is procedurally generated at each episode with many types of objects that vary in colors and shapes and various types of compositional dynamics. For example, there are animals in the environment that can be grown if one brings them food or water, but uh, plants, for example, can only be grown if one brings them water. And so during the first phase, the agent initially tries on them things, and there is a social peer in the environment uh, which provides linguistic descriptions of what he did uh, in an episode. And so the agent is going to learn the meaning of these descriptions and reuse them as his own goals uh, in the next uh, episode. And then comes an interesting part. After the first phase, there is now an autonomous exploration phase in which the social peer does not speak anymore. And in the second phase, the agent continues to sample goals as sentences already uttered by the social peer and training uh, to solve this goal. But most importantly, the agent can now invent new out of distribution goals by recombining, recombining words to form new sentences, modeling their meaning using the learned goal achievement function, and using this internal reward function to train the policy to achieve this uh, out of distribution goals. And so to evaluate such mechanisms for out of distribution language and goal imagination, we have made a series of experiments and they study the capacity of the agent to achieve test goals from a test set, never written by the cell peers. We have compared, uh, we have compared various goal uh, imagination techniques. Uh, we have studied like how it can uh, differentially boost various type of language generation. We also have exploration metrics showing how this form of goal imagination enables creative discoveries. And then finally, we have some fun qualitative analysis, like seeing an agent uh, imagining the goal of growing a plant, 
that is an, a goal never uttered by the social peer. And then first trying to do it by giving food to the plant because its action policy generalizes to the, uh, the strategy for growing animals. But then the learn uh, goal achievement function sees that this doesn't work in the sense that the animal doesn't grow. And so it self-supervises in order to adapt to the right behavior, which is here breaking water for growing the plant. So these experiments, uh, to conclude on it, show how language, once invented, provides a powerful cognitive tool for imagining out-of-distribution goals and enabling uh, open-ended creative innovation. And so in a sense, Imagine provides a, some sort of computational evidence and a statement from Daniel Dore, which summarizes well the main idea. First, we invented language, then language changes. And so it changes in many aspects, but here we have focused on the on compositional imagination enabling open-ended creative innovation. And so now to conclude uh, more generally on the two experiments I have just presented, we have seen that developmental structures in this model are neither learned tabula rasa nor a predetermined result of an innate program, but instead they self-organize out of the dynamic interaction between constrained cognitive mechanisms the morphological properties of the body and the physical and social environment. And so as a general conclusion, I'd like to propose a possible integration of the developmental mechanisms I have just presented with the higher level Evo Eco framework I have presented earlier in the talk. So recall that in this framework, um, environmental complexity is considered as the main driver of behavioral diversity in the human species based on evidence from paleoclimatology and human behavioral ecology that early humans might have been exposed to particularly chaotic environmental conditions. These challenging conditions might have bootstrapped the evolution of an intrinsic motivation to learn that can be explained because it maximizes long-term evolutionary fitness under rapidly changing environmental conditions. Then, as we have seen in the first experiment on the self-organization of vocal development, such intrinsically motivated exploration mechanisms can spontaneously discover some forms uh, of human language, but actually independently of any functional uh, pressure to communicate. And so obviously there is still a long way to go from the spontaneous discovery of complex vocal signals to the formation of a compositional language. And there are actually many relevant existing uh, contributions on emergent communication in mutation systems that are tackling this, uh, this challenge. But then, uh, as we have seen uh, in the second experiment, once language has emerged one way or another, it can then have strong feedback effects on, on agent cognitive abilities. And in particular, it enables open-ended creative innovation. And so this in turn opens the way toward the formation of a cultural repertoire, creating a positive feedback loop to environmental variability, potentially driving the ever-expanding uh, complexity of human skill acquisition. And so this will be my last word. I thank um, you for your attention and to uh, all my collaborators on, on these topics. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was Thank great. You. Okay, let's move on to our last speaker and then we'll go to our discussion panel. So thank you so much, Clement. And I'm happy to introduce our next speaker, Vivian. So while Vivian pulls up her slides, I'll give a brief introduction. Um, Vivian recently completed her PhD uh, re recently completed her PhD studies as a student at University of Osnabrück in Germany on computational cognition, and I'm very happy to say she decided to join Nementa as a research scientist. So her um, research focuses on working on neural networks to learn meaningful world representations in 3D virtual environments, and she has written extensively about using the brain to inform AI algorithms to learn as an active sensory motor process. So thank you, Vivian, for presenting today. And whenever you're ready, take it away. Yeah, thanks for the nice introduction. Um, can you see my slides? Yep. All right. Um, I'll try to keep this talk short so we still have some time for our discussion because I'm very excited to talk with the other speakers. Um, so yeah, um, my talk will be a little bit more on the side of showing some uh, results of experiments. Uh, so basically I'm taking the ideas that were presented previously of uh, letting um, 
AI learn uh, through sensory motor experience and also making AI learn a bit more how children learn. And I'm looking what effect this actually has on what is being learned in these AI systems. Okay, just to motivate this a bit, current AI systems have a lot of flaws and points where you notice that they are not really doing the same thing that our brain is doing. I'm sure this picture on the left is familiar to people who are in the AI or computer vision field. So for example, if you take an image and add some very minor uh, noise to it, um, for a human, it still looks exactly the same as before. But for an artificial neural network that was trained to recognize um, objects and images, uh, this changes the classification radically from a panda to a gibbon. Um, and also with these natural images that where nothing was uh, changed, um, they can trick these neural networks into classifying strange objects like a sea lion in this image or a rocking chair here, where a human would never think that there's a rocking chair here or um, a pretzel in this picture. Um, but you can maybe see where the network is coming from. And um, it has been shown that these artificial neural networks um, kind of focus more on texture and less on global shape. Um, so here you may see this texture may like, look like the texture of a sea lion, but uh, shape is just completely different. Um, and there are other, uh, other parts where the abilities of neural networks just don't match human abilities. For example, the ability to continually learn without forgetting uh, what was previously learned, uh, to extrapolate knowledge to new tasks, to learn causal models, uh, and to learn efficiently from a few labeled examples. And um, there may be many approaches to this, but the approach I'm presenting today is to try and change the environment and task in which these um, networks learn to be more similar to how humans actually learn. So, Similar to Clement, I'm also taking inspiration from Piaget. So here are the um, stages of development he proposes. And I'm not going to go into the details, but you can see um, that the human mind develops over many, many years um, and gradually. So you start out simply interacting with the world in the beginning, very weak supervision. Um, learning sensory motor contingencies and so on. And then you start attaching words to objects, you learn language, uh, you start to learn um, uh, uh, inductive and deductive reasoning, later on abstract thinking, thinking about philosophy, math, and so on. But it gradually builds up over time. And compared to how humans learn, there is a body, there's active interaction with the world, and most of the learning actually happens uh, without supervision or self-supervised. Um, and th those are the factors that I will be looking at. And uh, this quote from Alan Turing, uh, instead of trying to produce a program to simulate the adult mind, why not rather try to produce one which simulate the child's? If this were then subjected to an appropriate course of education, one would obtain the adult brain. So I'm approaching it from this angle, basically taking an artificial agent, letting the agent simply interact with the world and uh, learn a model of the world through interaction and then seeing what is actually being learned and what can we do with this. And I work with this uh, 3D maze environment. It's from the obstacle tower challenge. So you have this agent that walks uh, through this maze, there are multiple rooms and levels and doors, different types of doors. Um, there are blue time orbs that can be picked up to get more time. And then also at later levels, the agent has, for example, to pick up a key and unlock a door or um, solve some spatial puzzles, uh, avoid enemies and so on. So it's uh, pretty, can get pretty complex and involves a lot of uh, visual input. 
All right. So here's uh, the conditions. We have one embodied agent with an active loop between action and perception, meaning um, the agent receives an image of the world, how, how he sees it right now. This gets processed by a neural network to produce an action, and this action then leads to the next um, perception. And the two control conditions that are not embodied, so no sensory motor learning, are one um, self-supervised learning condition, an autoencoder that simply tries to reconstruct the input, and a classifier that is uh, fully supervised trying to classify objects in the in the images and um, the key point here is that the network in between here is exactly the same for all three conditions the only variable that is uh, changed in these experiments is um, how they're actually learning whether they're learning um, through sensory motor interaction and if they're learning uh, fully supervised or self-supervised all right, um, here's what the sensory motor learning agent actually learned. So these are the activations inside the neural network uh, corresponding to um, different images. Um, and they are quite high dimensional. So here they are projected into two dimensional space using TSNE. And you can see even in two dimensional space, uh, they form quite nice clusters and um, these clusters seem to be separated by the kind of action that was performed, but also here the red circles circle all the images that contain these um, yellow doors that lead to the next level. Um, that these cluster within these action clusters also, um, which kind of makes sense. So a door on the right side of the image should be encoded differently than a door on the, on the left side of the image or in the center because you need to perform a different action to actually walk through the store. But a door on the right side under different illumination conditions like these three pictures here, um, it doesn't really matter to encode them very differently because it's not action relevant. Um, and here are the correlations. Um, first, the green part um, of the encodings with actions uh, there is only a correlation in the embodied agent, but then interestingly, the correlation with objects in the image, in the observations, there's a correlation in the classifier as expected, but also in the embodied agent, even though it doesn't get any information about the objects um, in a supervised way. And another interesting thing is that the activations in the network of the embodied agent um, are much, much, much sparser than the activations in the autoencoder or the classifier, which means it only uses a few select neurons to represent each input image. Um, just to quantify it a bit, but I'm not going to go into detail for time. Um, there are only about less than 5% of neurons used to encode an image um, which has uh, over 84,000 pixels. Uh, pixel values, um, and uh, still the, a lot of the neurons are used. So it's not that it's only the same 5% all the time, but a variety of different sparse patterns is being used to encode the input. Um, and all three conditions kind of start at the same point and then diverge uh, in the sparsity of the representations which is very interesting because in, in nature, in the brain, um, we also find very sparse um, encodings of sensory input. So uh, in summary, the representations learned through weekly supervised or self-supervised exploration are structured and meaningful. They encode action-oriented information in very sparse activation patterns. And the encodings learned through interaction differ significantly from the encodings learned without interaction. So the next question would be, can we build on these encodings and use them for tasks such as few shot object detection? So basically moving from the sensory motor stage to the pre-operational stage. And we know with children that they can learn to attach a word to an object or meaning with only one or very few examples. Uh, it's a process called fast mapping. You can still do it as an adult. Um, 
And uh, in contrast, neural networks usually require thousands of label, labeled examples. And now the idea is um, letting the agent learn purely through curious interaction with the world. There are no external rewards, um, just trying to explore a lot and interacting with the world and then taking the learned representations of the world and giving a few labeled examples and see how this works out. Same three conditions again. Um, and then the idea is to take an input image, see what activations are active in the network and detect an object in this image. But how can we attach these uh, learned activations to objects? And for this, uh, we use a procedure called fast concept mapping. Um, so we take a few examples of the concept, let's say five pictures of a yellow door. We see uh, what kind of neurons are active in response to this image in the trained network. Um, we look at which neurons are active together in each image and sum up these uh, co-activations of neurons. Um, and then we take these uh, co-activations and look at which ones are consistently active together over these five example images. And this then defines the concept for the door. And as a detail, um, it can be weighted by how consistent it is actually present in these images. And you can do this for any concept that you like to extract, as long as the agent has learned it during the unsupervised exploration, it can be extracted in this simple way. Um, and then for inference, if we have a new image, we just put this image into the brain of the agent. We look at which neurons are active and compare it to the learned concept of the yellow door. And if enough, if there's enough overlap in these activities, um, if there's enough evidence, we say, okay, there's a level door. We can do this for all of the concepts that have been learned. Um, and the nice thing about this is it works with surprisingly few examples. So here with one example already, we have above chance um, accuracy on detecting, um, for instance, a, a yellow door. Um, and if you show a few more examples, it gets better already, 50 examples. Um, if it's the right kind of examples, it already approaches the accuracy of a fully supervised classifier trained on um, almost 8 million examples. Um, and it works much better than on the autoencoder or a random network. Um, and interestingly, it uh, works about equally well as with the classifier representations, which were optimized for detecting exactly these concepts. Um, so why does this work so well? Uh, the idea behind this is that if, there, if we have learned a good encoder, then few examples of a class should already be representative of the overall pattern that is used to encode this class, so, uh, which you can see here now, five examples of the door. The patterns that are consistently active in these five examples can be found again if we look at 250 examples of, the, of those kind of doors. Um, yeah, and another interesting thing is uh, you can in reverse also use this method to look at what the agent actually learned during the unsupervised exploration. For instance, here you can see it struggles with the key door and the key. And if you look at the performance of the agent, you can see it hasn't really learned yet how to pick up the key and unlock the door. And this is reflected in how well you can actually extract these concepts from the representations that were learned. Okay. Um, Another nice thing, you can add as many concepts as you like. If the, uh, if the concept is encoded, it can be extracted without having to retrain anything, um, without requiring huge amounts of labeled data, just five examples um, are enough. You extract it, save it, and can recognize it later on. So in summary, the representations learned um, 
encode information about concepts which were never explicitly taught. So the agent learned uh, just through curiosity. It was never told, this is a door, this is a time orb, this is a key, or anything like that. Uh, the concepts can be learned with very few examples. Um, it has no problem with catastrophic forgetting, because if you add another label, um, you don't uh, retrain actually the whole network. The network has already been trained through sensory motor interaction. Um, and therefore, there's also no need for a big label data set. Um, and overall, uh, learning more natural seems to lead to some abilities that we uh, also find in humans, such as fast mapping. So now just uh, my high level takeaways uh, from what I've been working on over the past years. Uh, our brains are sensory motor systems, and if we want to model them, our models should be as well. Um, what a model learns is a reflection of its environment and task. So here in these experiments, all the models and learning methods uh, were exactly the same deep neural networks, same structure, same backpropagation, uh, and so on. Um, the difference was really in the, in the task and the way learning was happening. And uh, third, uh, if we want to understand cognition and our brains, we need to understand the tasks that need to be solved. Uh, so the cognitive aspect of it, computational problems that need to be solved. And uh, if our artificial models, uh, if we want our artificial models to learn brain-like representations, we need to let them learn tasks that brains actually need to solve. And yeah, that's it from my side. A, yeah, I think I end on time. So we have some good time for discussions and questions. Great. Thank you so much, Vivian. Thank you, Vivian. Thank you, Vivian. All right, let's move on to the discussion and Q&A then, since we have 30 minutes left. So thank you, everyone, for still being here. And for our attendees, if you have any questions, feel free to just add it in the Q&A function below. And you can comment and also vote on the questions you'd like asked. So yeah, let me first open it to the panelists first. And do you guys have any questions? Yeah, I have a, I can ask sort of a high level question for to all three speakers as I was listening to the talks. Um, this is sort of uh, motivated by really Clement's video of the baby uh, uh, exploring the world. And this has to do with kind of the nature of intrinsic exploration. And Vivian, you know, you showed how important that sort of sensory motor stage of Piaget's development is to to you know being able to do quick, you know one shot learning or quick few shot learning uh, later and so on. So I guess the sort of high level question maybe it, it's not clear that the, the role that reward plays in that initial stage. And it you know if you think about the baby, there's no clear external reward from the world. Um, and in, in with babies, it may be a really long period, maybe several years potentially, where the nature of external reward is really unclear. Uh, and it's really about intrinsic exploration and learning about the structure of the world so that you can later use it. And so it's almost, you know, one extreme view by point maybe that you know, you know, having no reward might be critical. And so I'm being intentionally controversial here, but uh, wondering, Rich, and then the others, uh, what you feel, you know, is to what, how does the reward framework fit into that stage? And, and what do you think about, uh, you know, that stage in, in general? Well, uh, let me be clear that um, I really agree that uh, creation of play, play is really super important. And play is creation of sub goals and, you know, goal oriented behavior that is orient oriented towards goals that are not the, uh, not reward. And this is really, really important. This is the, perhaps the most important way we formulate uh, structures in our mind is we propose sub problems and then we work on them and then we learn skills to achieve those sub problems. And um, yeah. Yeah, I think I mean, there's so a relevant question in the, from the audience as well on this, you know, would it be better to define reward as goal satisfaction rather than purely extrinsic reward from the, from the environment? Yeah, so I guess this is something that, 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 that Jeff has, has thought about as well. You know, what is the, what is the, 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 the interplay between 
the uh, understanding the world and creating sub problems that are that are different than than reward. And then there is there is the goal. There is the thing that you're trying to achieve. Um, and, and I do feel that the the sub problems are sub subsidiary. They are they are a means to the end, and the end is still has to be defined uh, in, in a special way. Yeah, it seems as a just as a personal observation that we you know that I get a lot of satisfaction out of solving problems that I pose to myself. There's a there's definitely a reward that goes on. It's the aha moment. It's the damn I figured that out type of thing. You know whether you're solving a crossword puzzle or you're solving a brain problem. You know it's and so um, I've always felt that there had to be some sort of uh, reward mechanism itself for the ability to complete a model, to, to find the structure in something itself is a reward that doesn't necessarily have a direct evolutionary benefit um, uh, ultimately, but I suppose that I'm not, I, I always kind of viewed that outside of sort of this external reward, but maybe it's not, maybe it's the same thing, I don't know. But, um, but there seems to be this sort of uh, tremendous reward that some of us get at least <laughs> um, from just whatever problem, even a made up problem that has no real life world consequences, just solving it <laughs> seems to be a very pleasurable thing to do. I don't know how anyone feels about that. That may, may be what the child is doing in those situations. Uh, I think that is actually, yeah, there is definitely a reward in this case of like uh, self goal generation, as you said, and also in the like the very young infant playing in the room. And actually these rewards are likely the same nature that rewards we, what we call external reward in reinforcement learning, like getting food or whatever. And in any case, there is actually no reward in the environment. The rewards are, are internal, they are in the brain. The environment don't, doesn't contain any reward uh, in itself. And so this is maybe one of, of let's say, uh, 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 assumption of reinforcement learning that doesn't really sound biologically, which is the reward is, is considered as being provided by the environment, whereas biologically it is actually not. Uh, the, the reward is like a sensation, typically an internal sensation, in, to reuse the words uh, of, uh, of Rich. And, uh, and so I think an, another, an interesting question related to this is basically how does evolution uh, optimize the internal reward system of organisms in order to maximize their evolutionary fitness in the long term. And for example, like internal rewards, like setting, being able to set its own goals and then getting internally rewarded or intrinsically rewarded when you achieve them might actually be a, have some evolutionary advantage, for example, when you are in environments uh, that are pretty unpredictable, you might actually have a clear evolutionary advantage to be able to set your own goals and try to achieve well, them well, I think, and well, get rewarded. Yeah, I think there's a clear advantage uh, to uh, have an, uh, an organism uh, want to discover the structure of the world and figure it out, right? Um, so I guess I was a little curious for Rich there is that, does that fit in the reward is enough or do you view that as a different type of reward? Uh, uh, I, I'm a little confused by that, but... Um, you know, is that, is that like a different type of reward than you were talking about? Or do you say, no, that's just the rewards we all, I've been talking about all along. Because it seems a little different than a sort of environmental reward, or at least not a direct environmental reward. Yeah, well, so I always have a little trouble seeing why there's confusion here. We, we know, we, 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 the observation is animals are goal-directed. But they also, if their if their goals are not threatened, they like to learn about the world, and you know they're they're undoubtedly reusing the mechanisms to learn about the world. Um, that they also learn to use to survive or to get their ultimate goal. Uh, and uh, so you think it's the same? It's yeah, just, I mean, I mean, it I is a mystery. I should, it's a fault. I mean, let, let me let me embrace the mystery. The mystery is that, you know, why do we play? Because by definition, play is, is not, if, if, if by play we mean things that we do, like we play soccer or we play chess or we play parcheesi, we learn and we, we learn to do math things even if they're not relevant. Uh, we learn all these things and we enjoy them. And, um, 
it's 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 you could say it's a mystery and you know or maybe it's like basic research because basic by de by definition all these things are things that we do uh separated from their utility and and uh and yet we know that we do do basic research and we justify basic research because we think that oh it may not be obvious but someday it will be useful and similarly you know when we see a child play uh, we think, well, yeah, he's learning how to do the blocks and he's learning good, good blocks and someday that will be useful. And then maybe evolution has built in uh, something that makes him realize that and realize that it's, that it's, that it's pleasurable. And you know, evolution has encoded the, the idea that uh, there's this thing that, that uh, predicts future fitness or future ability. I think that's all, that's all fine. Maybe as an adult, uh, sometimes this mechanism has uh, continued on beyond its utility, potential utility. Um, you know, <laughs> I spend, if I spend hours doing crossword puzzles, I'm not sure I'm learning anything new, but maybe I am. <laughs> Who knows? I, I had a question for Clement, if, that's, uh, if it's all right just to throw that out right now. Uh, you talked about language as uh, being used for out of distribution, um, setting out of distribution goals. Um, is language necessary for that? I mean, could I do that without language? Can I just visualize out of distribution goals or do I need, I mean, obviously if it's gonna be conveyed to me from someone else, I need language, uh, but internally, uh, do I need that? Yeah, well, there is, for example, a, a debate in cognitive science about uh, where, com well, where is compositionality, uh, compositionality um, implemented in a sense? Is it like only a language property or is it also maybe a property of the sensory motor system? Uh, well, the brain is quite modular as well. So, so yeah, it's not totally clear where, where compositionality originates, basically. So, so you're, you're, uh, open to, you're open to the idea that it may not be requiring language then? Um, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. From, okay. for example, the computer experiments I have shown uh, would uh, probably work as well uh, with any compositional uh, mechanism that allow to combine different goals together. But then what the particular function of language here is also to act, like to be able to learn the relationship between um, like experience in the environment and goals and uh, language through interaction with an ideal social peer yeah and so then this can actually uh, bootstrap basically this compositional aspects that then leads to compositional goal, goal imagination yeah but it's not it's essentially you're you're not arguing it's absolute requirement for an individual uh, to have language to do those things um i mean there's a lot of smart mammals um and i i would like to believe that they're also able to think about things that you know don't exist and <laughs> try to imagine and from a neural mechanism point of view i prefer that as well so it sounds like you're open to that idea then um that if, it, well, if, least... if, if we if we limit the analysis to compositional goal imagination i agree this can be done okay. by any compositional mechanism then okay. uh there is also in the model this aspect of uh interacting with the social peer to actually get description and this can be done i think only through language yeah. um vivian i think you had your hand up earlier did you have a comment uh i had more of some uh uh, interesting evidence of how strong curio the curious drive is in humans. I recently read a paper that was, they gave some people uh, pens and told them some of them are electrified if you click them. And <laughs> the people had no incentive to actually click them, but they would still do it to figure out which ones are electrified. Um, and uh, also with rats already in the 1950s, I think they showed that uh, rats would walk over an electrified ground in order to explore new parts of the cage. So it seems to be pretty ingrained and play is something you find all across the animal kingdom. So um, I think it's quite an important reward uh, for, for learning. Mm -hmm. I suppose if those pens killed you, you wouldn't do that, but it's mild. I assume yeah. it's, a, it's a mild shock, I imagine. It's like, it's like sticking a nine volt battery on your tongue. You know, it's like, why do you keep doing it? You know? <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I, I think Schmechuba said something like, I don't know exactly how it feels to put my hand into a meat grinder, but then again, I also don't want to. So yeah. like some things you, you can imagine that uh, you don't need to know how the experience actually is. But yeah, yeah in yeah. some of those cases, imagination is better than actual experience. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, were there questions in the Q&A uh, that, that I, I Yeah, I so have, there's a question, yeah, uh, from I think Lucas. What, what are some examples of recent work trying to cross the bridge between knowledge of the world as done in good old fashioned AI and experiential knowledge? Um, so I'm imagining this is for Rich and Clement. Come on. I guess maybe nothing. <laughs> <laughs> There's just we get so much to say. Yeah. Um, uh, so the basics are off policy learning. Uh, so so who was it today who talked about? I think it was Cuomo about. Um, you know, a robot's trying to learn all of its skills, has many skills, and so it picks a skill and then works on it. And, and that's cer certainly an important part of it. But, but what all policy means is that you can learn about a skill even when you're not working on it. Like you can learn how the world works even if you're not, even if you're trying to, I don't know, make tea and you still learn how the world works because you see the way that it works. Um, and so there's, lot, there's lots of things that can be learned in parallel. You don't have to commit, oh, I'm following this thing, so I'm learning about this. No. I'm doing stuff. And then I, I want to learn about everything I can learn from what I'm doing. And often there's many things you can learn. And, and so the word policy, policy means you know, the, the way you're behaving. And, and even though you can only behave in one way, you can learn about many ways because because what you're actually doing will overlap with many different things. And so you, so this is off policy learning and, and there's a whole, whole field of it really about how to learn off policy. Is it possible to learn off policy? What things can be learned off policy? What things can't? Um, can you learn off policy about value functions? Can you learn off policy about, about new policies? Um, yeah, so off policy learning is like a big thing that that I think is part of learning knowledge. Um, another thing, let me let me talk about something new that I'm working on. I don't know. I think it, I think it would be fun, uh, and I'll, I'll teach you a new fun word. The word is stomp, stomp, S T O M P, and it stands for the progression. It's a, it's a, it's it's the progression for creating um, uh, cognitive structure about about things that you might do. So stomp means you start with a subtask and you convert it to an option which solves the subtask, achieves the subtask. Once you have the option, ST, subtask, O, STO, STO, the O, then you learn a model of the, of the uh, option and then you use the model for planning. So that's how we get stomp. The idea is that the stomp progression is the way uh, uh, skills are formed, they start with the subtask. If they not, not sk skills is just, just, just the option. And it's the whole it's the whole thing from subtask to now I have a new way of thinking about the world and I can plan what to do with it. Okay? Yeah, so the stomp progression is sort of an old idea, but we just named it recently. So so we're sort of <laughs> so claiming it again. <laughs> I was gonna say it seems sort of a natural way to think about things. Yeah, yeah, um, just a natural way of thinking about it. But but you know maybe it needs maybe to be identified. I think in some sense uh, the talks here today and then this whole theme today is like that because it, everyone knows about sensory motor interaction. It's so obvious, you know. But but as you pointed out eloquently, Rich and others mentioned too, that it hasn't really been part of. Uh, it's sort of been the elephant in the room in some sense. No one talks about it for so long, and you know I'm always wondering. Uh, you know, is, is it going to be like a big reckoning one day where we say, oh, my God, we've been doing this all wrong? Or is this going to be sort of gradually sliding into, you know, yeah, we just we, we knew that all along. We worked we were getting towards that sensory motor goal all along. You know, um, that's not clear to me, actually, because there's so much in the uh, machine learning AI world today is 
very oblivious to the whole idea of sensory motor learning. Um, but as you point out, there's a lot of people picking it up too. So, um. well, just to focus on that history, you know, like we can see similar transformations. Like the old AI was all about expert systems and symbols, and now the modern AI is all about about deep learning and and, and neuron like things. And you know, that's happened fairly gracefully. I mean, there are still old guys like myself. Well, old, old guys, but no, not myself, that are sitting back saying, oh, no, we need to do symbolic things and we need to do logic. And, uh, but mostly the field has said, oh, there's this, this is a different view of thinking. It's just not so symbolic. And this gap you are mentioning is basically about how to bridge this, uh, like, data centric approach to AI with, like, the oldest uh, symbolic approach to it, right? This is what the, this gap recite basically. And so if we, yeah, the, the challenge is basically to, to be able to, to create these symbols from the sensory motor stream. Yeah. I think it's exactly what Jeff is talking about, a, a, a conflict between worldviews. The, the deep learning worldview and the, the logic and symbols world are totally different worldviews. There are very promising approaches to to basically bridge this gap, I think, in the modern uh, machine learning literature. In particular, uh, there is um, all uh, this excitement around graph, graph neural networks that are basically graphs that are implemented as neural networks and so are differentiable. And so that you can basically train also with sensory motor data and then get uh, some um, relational, um, like learn some relation, some relationships between different concepts and also abstract them and gain some sort of symbols, which looks pretty promising as a, as a way to basically bridge this. Yeah, that's uh, it's pretty close to the research we're doing at Nementa right now. So um, I think you're right about it. Colin. It's, it's um, there, there's a there's a middle ground where you assume there's some structure to the world that could be represented by graphs in some sense, and um, but but it has to be learned experientially. Um, and, uh, and so there's a, there's a fun foundation that assumes that there's a, a structure, a graphical structure, but, but the details are not known. And, um, and that's, that seems to be the middle ground and we're shooting for that here, um, but we'll see how it plays out. Yeah, there's a question in the Q and A that sort of relates to this. Um, uh, let me read it out and I'll kind of explain why it's curious. You know, it says, since machines, unlike the brain, can be connected to the cloud internet sensors in spatially distant locations, could this accelerate sensory motor learning due to more availability of data? And I find this a curious question because I think in general in deep learning, there's the sense that in the world, there's more and more and more data and there's you know GPT-3 and GPT-4 and so on being trained on massive amounts of web data. But sensory motor learning feels very different. Um, you can't take all of this existing static data and say that's sensory motor learning. So is sensory motor learning inherently bottlenecked in this way? Or, or is this huge explosion of data that's out there, is, can it actually help accelerate sensory motor learning? Well, you say it was bottlenecked in this way. What do you mean by bottlenecked in this way? By bottlenecked uh, in the sense that the agent has to take action and to see the consequences of those actions, you can't take some existing- oh, see, So that might be a, you, you might be a bottleneck because it takes That's, too long is to Is that an action. inherent bottleneck? Uh, yeah, or, exactly. Well, it's, you it's can't an take advantage. someone else's experience. I see. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's an advantage, right? But you're saying it's a, it's a bottleneck to using huge amounts of data that's on the internet. Correct, like yeah, yeah. Got it. Interesting question. There's also a lot of excitement recently on offline reinforcement learning that basically try to apply reinforcement learning methods, but to a static data set of sensory motor experience, which might also be a, an interesting step in this direction. Yeah, I, I think uh, sensory motor learning presents itself as a good solution for like learning the basic structure of the world, like how everything works. But then once you get to points where action is actually very costly or difficult, like for example, in a hospital deciding the treatment of patients, you can't just experience and play around and see if the patient dies or not. Um, you kind of have to build on this model of the world that you learned before and also be incorporated 
uh, be able to incorporate knowledge about the model that other people have accumulated through research, um, where I guess then this purely experiential learning uh, that doesn't work so well anymore. So it's an interesting question whether language fills that role, because typically, like we're doing right now, language involves, um, there's an exploration to it as well. You'll say something, Vivian, and I won't understand you, and I'll say, well, what did you mean by that? And that's sort of me acting on your knowledge base in some sense. I'm, I'm, I'm performing an action, and I'm going to see what happens, what you say when I say something. Um, so it, that's an interesting way, just, I'm just saying it's an interesting way to think about it, expanding beyond what we can personally experience. Um, it's, it's not quite related to your, your hospital example, but the idea that there's things that you know, if you're, you're, I know that you're living in, in Europe right now and I could ask you about where you're living and I don't have to go there and I could probe you and you can answer. It's almost as if I was there um, and I could expand my knowledge base. So that's, you know, we've talked, a lot of people, we talked about language and Clement talked about it a bit, but language could be viewed that way. I suppose language could be viewed as a sensory mode of experience as long as I get to interact with you, as long as I get to probe you and say, you know, what happens if, you, if I say this, what are you going to say? And if I say this, what are you going to say? If I just have to listen to you, it's not as good. <laughs> just an observation. This is actually the whole topic of the theory of uh, Daniel Dore uh, on the origins of language, uh, where basically he considers that the, one of the, one, maybe the original function of language is actually to bridge this experiential gap between different people. And, um, and so, yeah, basically, instead of considering language as a communication tool, it's more language about how to bridge the experiential gap between what, different people. There was a, which, what was, interesting. The, was there, there was a name for that? What was the name? I missed that one. Yeah, then it's a book on Daniel Dor called The Instruction of Imagination. Uh, I'm going to put it in the chat. All right, thank you. Um, I will say there are some specific questions for, for uh, some of the panelists that they could go on the Q&A uh, and ask as well. Um, a bunch for Vivian on, on your experiments uh, that you may want to uh, take a look at. I know we're getting close to the end here. I just, uh, there yeah. are several people asking about the recording of this uh, and I don't know if you responded to them, um, Charmaine or not about yep. when this when this would be re, re, uh, posted. Yeah, the recording will most likely be posted by the end of today, but I'm gonna say by the end of this week and I'll post a recording link to the meetup page and it'll be on our YouTube channel. So that'd be Nementa's YouTube channel. All right, I just saw there was a lot of questions about that. So. Uh, do we wanna attempt to, uh, one or two more questions before our time is up? Yeah, I mean, since there is a neuroscience flair to Brains and Bay, I'll ask one of the neuroscience connection uh, questions. You know, if I recall correctly, there is stimulation of dopaminergic pathways in recognition of novel stimuli. Uh, could this be what serves, could this be the substrate for goal formation and play and exploration as well? Um, and, uh, you know, I, I believe my understanding it is, but uh, Rich, I, you, you might know a lot more about that. I think that's a good way to think about it. Uh, there was a similar question earlier, not similar, but a uh, question about whether rewards are strictly scalar or can, is it meaningful to consider a vector of rewards? Is there some fundamental difference uh, between them or can we just simplify it and think of uh, rewards as being scalar? And I think that's interesting from a neuroscience standpoint as well, because as I, if I recall correctly, Ilana Witten's lab at Princeton and others have, are finding very that the dopaminergic signals are actually very rich representations. They're not necessarily single scalar. They, they have a distributed representations with, with sort of meaningful characteristics. And so I guess the question is, is does it need to be scalar? Or, or is it is not that it needs to be scalar? Or can we simplify it as being scalar? Or is there something intrinsically important of having distributed reward representations? I don't know if you have any, anyone has any thoughts on that. I want to get started on that just by, by saying that all of these are, are ways that we have of thinking about the mind. So, you know, you have to, so it's just our way of thinking about it. Like there is no signal in the brain that's labeled reward. Okay. 
the question is, is it useful for us to think about it as, as a scalar signal or as uh, or think about it in some other way? That's the question, dopamine, yes. dopamine, of course, is not reward. Dopamine is the TD error. And it's easily confused with reward. Um, uh, but it's, it's really like, it's moment by moment, things getting better, which is different from reward. So maybe you expected the reward and it wasn't as much as you were expecting. And so you're feeling bad. And so when, you know, like when Jeff solves a, 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 a problem he's working on, he feels satisfaction. We, we tend to say he feels rewarded by that, but maybe he only, he didn't get reward, but he just got uh, uh, an improvement in his value function, which would feel like reward because it would be the <laughs> dopamine and everything. But, and, and, and the TD error has a you know, reward, to, the, TD, the TD error, the temporal difference error that you're changing, moment by moment change in how well things are going as a component that's reward and also as a component in change in value. So change in value and reward, they add together to be the TD error, which is what dopamine can be interpreted as being, okay? And so reward and, and change in value, they feel the same. They both feel like dopamine. And the, the vast mass of your brain only gets dopamine. It doesn't get the reward. And we don't see the reward because the reward is not important only the combined combination of reward with the change in value, that's important. That, that, that combined thing is important. It needs to be spread everywhere, not the individual pieces. So this is a, this is a powerful way of thinking and, and, and it's all scalar. And, uh, and so it's very appealing to me. Um, but if you, it's also true that if once you have sub problems, which I love, each sub problem will have its own TD error. Okay, and so you would have roles for other uh, neurotransmitters compared to that TD error, or maybe they're all carried by dopamine. Somehow it's modulated in some other way. Uh, we know, we know, well, there, I think there's evidence that both of these things happen or could happen, and we can think about them. Um, and then there's the question about multiple uh, rewards. And again, it's, it's a question of how you want to think about things and, and how you want to use the words. I think, I think you know, to think about a goal-seeking system, you have to reduce it to one goal. You can't say, oh, what if I have six goals? Because eventually you might have to trade them off. You can't do all of them. Or if you can, then, then why? There's the, it's almost an oxymoron to say that I have multiple reward signals, or I have multiple goals. Um, but you, ha you, you can have uh, things that you work on when the other goals are, are sated or, or can't be influenced. Um, and, and this is also sort of controversial because there are lots of there are people that think, oh, uh, multi-criteria decision-making is a big, is a big uh, area in which you extend reinforcement learning. Reinforcing means limited only has one goal, if we could have six goals, that would be better. <laughs> and I want to say, I just always want to think, well, that's, that's somewhat, somewhat nonsense. You can only have one goal. And, uh, but you I mean, sometimes it's useful to think in all these different ways. And it's all a different way of thinking about things. I mean, it's interesting, as yeah. I understand it, dopamine is a neuromodulator and it's distributed broadly. So if you're going to have sort of separate vectors of dopamine, it either has to be located spatially different parts of the brain, or it has to be temporally separated, but it's not really a signal. And I mean, I'm not familiar with the research you, you've talked about, too, but they, so maybe they yeah, no, know. My understanding is there's a, a, a collection of dopamine, dopamine, you say neurons, and uh, the conditions under which they activate are... It's almost well, that, like it's a distributed, so it would be a distributed representation of reward prediction error. But, but, they, but, error but, but ultimately right. what they do is they, these neurons, they, they spread their, their axons across broad areas of the brains and release these neuromodulators. So you've That's lost right. your, yeah. you've lost your specificity then. So then it could be, you know, they could be acting in different places. Um, you know, I don't know, it's an interesting question, but I, I think uh, Rich's comment is really interesting. Right? It's, it's almost an oxymoron to say it's multiple goals because you got to pick one and, and if they can all be solved at the same time. And I guess that was one goal. So it's like, it wasn't multiple goals to begin with. Um, interesting observation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, I think it's around time to wrap up. So any last questions from the panelists? Great, so very, thank you very, so much very, yeah, for coming. It's a very interesting group you have here. Thank well, you thank very much for inviting me. Thank you for participating, Rich and Clement and Vivian. Uh, you guys are all great, great presentations. And um, I know that uh, a lot of people got a lot out of it. So, um, and I said more people will be watching online. We know that's true. Okay, well, that's great. All right, thank and, you so much. Thank you so much. And I'll post a recording to the meetup page shortly. So, yeah. All right, you guys have a good, uh, a good day and a weekend. Have a good day and happy holidays, everyone. Hey, happy holidays, that's what I should have said, yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. All right, bye now. Yeah, bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.